father for the first two, three months of their life. Hmm. And then they begin to take on other characteristics as they get older, other, other family and maternal. Because it's the way that the pack stamps paternity. Huh? I'm, and any time that you don't hear me, or any time that you want me to repeat something, or you want to stop, you just stop because this is this. We can stop and start at any oh, time. Oh, they can cut that out and they cut that cut out, it. just scissor it out. Because uh, I uh, sometimes I uh, things don't kind of register like they ought to. I uh, I kind of have to mill it around before I get the drift of what's. Uh, Really well, anytime well. you want to come back to something or anything like that, you just well, let me know. Okay? Well, let's... And I'll just tell you briefly, I'm going to ask you first to, to uh, just talk about yourself, your name and where you were born and when you were born and about your family, who your parents and your grandparents and great-grandparents and so mm -hmm. forth were, and where you went to school and what you did for a living. Mm -hmm. And if you forget, I'll prompt you, okay? Yeah, well, All that, right. that sounds uh, okay. fair enough. All right. Well, so yeah. you can start out any time well, with fine. your name. <laughs> fine. So it would start, sure. well, uh, my name is Earl Carrillo, and uh, I was born in 1903 in the same house that I now live in on, uh, it used to be the main section of the Guerneville Highway where it hit 116, about four miles north of Sebastopol. And uh, when I was young, well, of course, that was horse and buggy days. There were no automobiles at all. And uh, I went to grammar school at Oak Grove Grammar School. And uh, at that time, everybody, every family had at least one cow, maybe two cows, a bunch of chickens and cats and dogs like they still do. But uh, when I uh, went to grammar school, I had to drive cows from where we were down on the uh, uh, railroad track between Forceville and Sebastopol by Grayton and put them in pastures. And, uh, in the winter time, why I'd go right from grammar school through Grayton and pick them up and take them home. In the summer time, why I'd go home first and do chores and have to go after the cows. And uh, after I graduated from grammar school, I went to uh, Anley High School in uh, 1919, and I graduated in 23. And Two years of that time, I rode uh, the Petaluma and Santa Rosa Railroad from what we called Jane Station. Then they changed it to Garbro, and, uh, in the, and then there was a station right above the high school on North Main Street in Sebastopol where we got off. And uh, then in the last year of high school, I had a Model T Ford automobile, so I... Uh, uh, drove to school by myself, but how, how old? Tell, tell us how old you are, and well, and what year you were born, because this is yeah. Well, I uh, yeah, I was born in 1903, so I'll be uh, 93 the 16th of next month. So uh, coming up <laughs> pretty close, but uh, there've been an awful lot of changes since I can remember things. And uh, my father was drowned in Russian River in 1906, which was uh, right after the earthquake. The earthquake was in April of 1906, and he was drowned in July of 1906. But I, I can even remember some of the things that, that happened at that time. A lot of people say you don't remember that young, but I... I definitely remember uh, the earthquake shaking the fireplace down in the house and uh, uh, the carpenters coming and cleaning it out and having to patch the floor and the ceiling and the roof of the house. What was your father's name? Manuel, uh, uh, Manuel Carrillo, and he was a daughter of Marta Carrillo, who was a daughter of 
Maria Carrillo. So I'm a... He was the a, son, right? Uh, he, he was the son of uh, Marta. And uh, so uh, that makes me a, a great-grandson of Maria Carrillo. And uh, she was General Vallejo's mother-in-law, is how she happened to come from San Diego up into this uh, territory. And I don't know how many children she had, but she must have had quite a few of them because there were, were uh, a lot of them like uh, Fitch, Mrs. Fitch was a Carrillo. Both Vallejos, Murillo and Salvador, both married Carrillos, which were sisters of my grandmother. And uh, that's what's kind of confusing in, in my branch of the family. My ancestors are from my grandmother's side, but she never changed her maiden name. She married a Carrillo, so it kept the Carrillo name. Uh, otherwise, it would have been different. But who, who, your mother, who was your mother's family? My mother was uh, Elizabeth Meyer. And she was born out west of Petaluma, where, if if I uh, get things straight, it must have been out in Shalano Valley or out in that neck of the woods. And uh, she was born of, uh, of uh, her, both her mother and father came from the country of Alsace-Lorraine, mm -hmm. in between France and Germany. And uh, I don't know what year they came over, but uh, they had never met till they got in the United States, and then they met, and they were both from a couple of towns that weren't over five, six miles apart in uh, in Europe. Tell me about now. What have you been doing for these ninety-three years that you've been here? What did you do for a living? And well, uh, of course, when when I was a kid, we we had to do chores and uh, and. There was always lots to do. There was everything was uh, wood burning stoves, coal oil lanterns, and uh, such as that, and cows and chickens that we had lots of chores. And then when I got out of high school in 1923, I worked for Fry Brothers, driving a tractor for a short time, and I got an opportunity to go to work in a in the Grayton Bakery, which was called the Russian River Bakery. They had a bakery in Grayton and one in Guerneville. And I went to work there, it must have been in, uh, well, 23, right after high school. And I worked there until uh, about 25. Then I uh, got acquainted with a, a young fellow from Germany, and he was going back home and he talked me into going back to Germany with him. And uh, we shipped on board a boat and went up as far as Puget Sound and, and into uh, Seattle and uh, took on cargo and then came back and we went up the Columbia River up past Portland and took on cargo there and, and uh, uh, most of it was heavy uh, uh, ore for the lower part and then lumber up on top and we went down through Panama Canal at that time I, that canal was only open about what, eight years or so and so there was still lots of evidence of French diggings and uh, machinery and stuff yet at that time so uh, I uh, got an eye infection and had to go into a marine hospital in New York. And <laughs> by the time that uh, I, I got out of there, well, I decided I wanted to go home. <laughs> so uh, I uh, uh, bought a, a train ticket and came back and I had uh, uh, some relatives in Salt Lake City. So I wanted to go by Salt Lake and, and then from Salt Lake to San Francisco. Well, in, in New York, they wanted to ship everybody to Los Angeles. And I said, I didn't want to go to Los Angeles. San Francisco was 500 miles north of there that I wanted to go there. So they finally arranged a ticket. So I went to Denver and then up 
over the Denver Rio Grande to Salt Lake City, and uh, then from there came on uh, to San Francisco. And then, after I got home, I uh, worked in several bakeries in Santa Rosa. There was the old snow system down on 4th Street. There was a Franco-American on 3rd, and uh, uh, let's see, there was uh, Tuscany on 7th Street, I guess it was, and then then I got an opportunity to go to work in Sebastopol. So I uh, thought that was closer to home, and I uh, went to work for the Royal Bakery for a couple of uh, German-Swiss people that had it, had what they called the Royal Bakery at that time, and I worked there eight years until they sold the bakery. Then I went into business for myself in 33. Now, people didn't go to grocery stores and buy their bread then. Well, uh, when I first went to work for the Russian River Bakery, there, I think there was one wagon came up from San Francisco that had bread and, and uh, one wagon that called very much. We practically supplied Russian River with bread and Occidental, Freestone. I even went as far as Tamales. Uh, delivering bread, and that's when the narrow gauge was running uh, up from uh, Point Reyes to uh, Casadero. Now, Eric tells me that you have a wonderful story about your aunt's remembrances of the Bear Flag Revolt. Oh, well, I grew up with the impression that, as she said, from the first that I uh, remember her, she said that she blamed the Bear Flaggers for the death of Maria Carrillo, her, her grandmother. And uh, the, the natives at that time were afraid of them. A lot of the Bear Flaggers were convicts. And uh, Maria took her family and, and went over and hid in the willows over by Tamales Bay. And while she was there, she caught pneumonia and passed away, I think, in 49 from, from uh, uh, the effects. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that goes, goes back to some of, some of the things. I, I've heard more for the uh, Carrillo history from my aunt than I remember of any anybody else. What was your aunt's name? Welty. Her name was Benicia. She was uh, uh, named after Benicia Vallejo mm -hmm. and uh, her name was Benicia Carrillo and she married a Welty that was a, a John Welty from Boston and he was a, a shoe manufacturer and he had control, uh, 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 foreman of the shoe factory on 2nd Street at the time of the earthquake. Did um did you did did you know your grandmother Marta? Uh, uh, Marta, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Uh, 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 I was pretty young when she passed away, uh, uh, though. But I I remember she lived on Fourth Street at the time that I knew down close to where College Avenue comes into Fourth, and uh, uh, she and her husband then. Uh, uh, my grandfather, I can remember him, and I don't remember them speaking English. I think they could only speak Spanish because my aunt used to interpret what we'd say to them and then what they'd say back, why she'd tell us, and, and that's the way we communicated. You did a lot of hunting and fishing in your life. Still oh, too, I you? grew up uh, uh, hunting. I think, I believe I started hunting when I was nine or ten years old because there used to be lots of cottontail and jackrabbits and quail right on our own place. And then after, well, I was still a teenager when I started deer hunting and I have deer hunted even, <laughs> even enjoy it yet, but uh, I, I don't hunt like I used to. But I, I got some awful nice trophies from Colorado and Modoc County. What 
what have you seen through the years, the way the game and fish and game have changed here in Sonoma oh, County? Oh, I've, I've got a, a book of fishing license where one dollar for a hunting license, one dollar for a fishing license. Last year I bought a fishing license that was twenty-four dollars and seventy-five cents or something like that, I think, and I never even used it. <laughs> so. Did you ever fish in the Laguna when there were lakes? Well, the well, there used to be Lake Ballard Lake, and there was Lake Geneve that was up by Sebastopol, which. Uh, was quite a picnic area. They had boats and swans swimming in the lagoon, and I remember Ballard Lake better than than anything. We used to go down there and and fish, and Russian River. What did you catch at Ballard Lake? We we caught mostly uh, uh, bass and uh, and uh, hard mouths, and I guess they call them squawfish, and uh, uh, there there were some trout. And uh, uh, then, uh, see, that emptied into Mark West Creek and Mark West emptied into Russian River. And Russian River used to be a wonderful steelhead stream when I was a kid. And you couldn't fish above uh, Bohemian Pool. That way they figured you had a fish in tidewater. Well, we used to fish uh, uh, up in uh, around Bohemian Pool. I think you could come up to... Uh, Oh, where that temporary bridge goes across the river from Neely's Road. I think that was Tidewater, they figured. And they wouldn't allow you to fish wouldn't above Wouldn't allow you to fish above that. Yeah, but, gee, I can remember, we used to spear fish and spear them legally. And uh, Russian River used to be full of striped bass. And they they came up. As far as uh, the Waller Ranch, where the river makes a turn and goes toward Healdsburg, and uh, there was a big pool there that, my gosh, a, a whole school of uh, striped bass would be in there at once, and we used to go and and uh, spear them. Gosh, some of them would weigh oh, 20 pounds or better. They a big, big fish. How many would you go home with on a good day? I didn't hear. How many would you take home with you on a Oh, day? about one is all we even uh, even intended to take, and that was about all we could carry because we'd take the streetcar to Forceville, then walk up over the over the hill and and down the the to the old railroad and and uh, fish to the river. <laughs> what about game? About deer and around here? Deer? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think there were any deer on the lagoon when I was a kid. There were some over by Occidental and uh, and uh, Monterio and Tyrone. That's uh, down between uh, Gern uh, uh, Occidental and Monterio, and uh, the old road used to to go around uh, there. And then they when they tore up the railroad track, where well, they followed the railroad right away. So, uh, Eric also tells me that you have a story, or you like to talk about it, an, an Indian artist that you knew. Oh, uh, from, uh, uh, gee, what was his name? I, uh, the one who used soapstone. And... Oh, gosh, I, he lives, uh, lives up uh, by, uh, Rio Dell up in in there. I uh, gosh, I, I I just his Sorry. name has slipped my mind now. That's okay. But uh, but he uh, he I used to know him quite well, and uh, as, as far as I know, I guess he's still alive out there. But I I have a, a painting there, a, a sketch that he has made of an Indian chief, and. Uh, I've collected Indian artifacts ever since I was a kid. We used to find it every place when, when I was a kid. Were there were there Indians around when you were a kid? Quite a lot of them, and uh, the only term that I ever heard them called we called them Digger Indians because they were always out in the 
uh, uh, woods and along the creeks and places digging. And, uh, but I, I guess they were Pomos and Miwoks. But, uh, uh, um, we, you talked a little bit, you mentioned Tyrone, and I, that's always interesting to me, is, is all of the place, the names that are gone, like right where you live was what? Su yes, Susan? yes. Was well, uh, Tyrone was quite a place. There were several big buildings uh, at where, Tyrone. Where was it? It was uh, uh, off of, of, of Dutchville Creek on the west side. And uh, the road went across Dutchville, went went by Tyrone, then came back and went to Monterio. It uh, I guess it would have about two or three miles. Uh, uh, that would be southeast of uh, Monterio. Between Camp Meek. Uh, yeah, on Dutchville Creek. What what about uh, where you live, where the roads cross there, where the blacks? Well, that up? was the main intersection of uh, Gurnville Road and uh, Gravenstein Highway North, which is 116 now. And they used to call it? Uh, uh, Gravenstein Highway well, I North. Thought, I thought they called that Sousa's Corners. Uh, well, uh, it was Carrillo Corners. Uh -huh. My uh, That's how, how my father went there. I have a picture of the blacksmith shop that he must have built around the turn of the century because uh, I have a, a picture now. He had a calendar, a 1960 calendar, a sixth calendar with uh, the picture of this uh, blacksmith shop on it, which uh, was a two-story building with uh, buggies, whips, and robes written on the front of, the front of it, then M. Carrillo on the top and on the roof of it it said Studebaker wagons he was a Studebaker dealer and uh, nearly all the wagons and buggies that he sold were Studebaker and in 1906 when when he passed away he had a, a car load of wagon and buggy parts with a Studebaker automobile in it that came out there my mother never broke the seal she uh, shipped it back to the factory. But, uh, um, talk, talk a little bit. You went to Oak Grove School. Talk to me about what school was like in those days. Oh, well, uh, of course, we didn't have a bus picking us up or a lunch served to us at noon in those days. We, we walked whether it was rain. And it, 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 if I remember right, our weather was different. When I was a kid, it used to rain sometime for a week or ten days straight, and we'd get to school, we'd be wet from walking. Uh, it was a mile, at least a mile, and uh, we'd all sit up around the wood fire and, and get dry while while we were in school. One teacher. They were. I think three when I went there. See, I started, it must have been... See, the kids didn't go to school until they were about eight or nine years old in those days, so uh, so it must have been a, about 1909 or 10 when I when I started to, to grammar school. And I think there were three teachers at that time. And... Uh, and, and and the the new schoolhouse at that time was built in uh, nineteen nine, I think. So up up until that time, it had been an old one room school. So. Uh, Five minutes. Okay, thank you. If um, um, I wanted to ask you too about, um, you know, we say that World War Two changed all of California and yeah, changed I, Sonoma uh, County. Talk to us a little bit about what Sonoma County was like before World War II. Well, uh, the uh, uh, before World War II, see, see, I was too young for World War I, and then I was too old for World War II. So I was right in, the, in between that, but uh, both my brothers went to World War I. One was in the Army and one was in the Navy. And uh, then, after World War One, 
things uh, began changing a little bit, but after World War II, they, they just, to my opinion, they've been going downhill ever, ever since. I, I think the last 50 years, they've devaluated our dollar, so I, I don't think a dollar's worth five cents to what it was before World War II. Tell me, you, you must have, as a, as a kid, you must have worked in the fields and picked, we, you and Marion were talking about picking prunes and picking apples, and talk a little bit about agriculture, the way it Well, uh, uh, yeah, that's all that it was around, uh, uh, I was right in the center of the Gravenstein Apple District, but at that time there were lots of cherries, and, uh, and cherries were one of the first crop that came on after school was let out in June. Then there was cherry picking, then there was uh, lots of berries. Berries, they planted berries first and, and planted orchards in the berry patch. And then when the orchards got big enough, so they were producing and they took the berries out. But when I was a kid, and there were only two varieties, or three varieties, there were Mammoths, Logans, and Lottons, and uh, none of these fancy young berries are, are uh, those at all. And uh, did you did you ever pick hops? I never picked hops, but uh, uh, lots of people uh, that I knew did. They they figured it was a vacation to get up on the river and camp through hop season, which only lasted about three or four weeks, and. Uh, They'd uh, go and set up a tent, and, and then, uh, uh, well, uh, any hop field of any size had their own uh, grocery store and butcher shop and, and a place where they could buy uh, uh, stuff to eat as they worked. Sometimes a place to swim. Yes, yes. Well, uh, well uh, I delivered uh, out to Waller Ranch, and uh, there was... Uh, two stores from Fortsville moved uh, stores out there and then they could get supplies from Fortsville out there pretty easily. It, uh, then that's fine. Um, we can do the last two. Okay, now tell us about this fine thing. Well, right here. this came from the old Carrillo Adobe and from what I've heard, it was brought up from, uh, 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 oh, Tiburon, where the whale boats used to come around Cape Horn and they'd come into Tiburon before they went up to the Bering Sea. And uh, people from up in this section would trade meat and hides and tallow for uh, goods and stuff from the the boats that they brought around from the East Coast. And uh, this uh, was evidently came around, I know it came around Cape Horn, and uh, as far as I know, they, they called him a hurdy gurdy. And uh, I always knew it as a music box or a hand organ, but uh, it uh, has been playing every. <laughs> Smithsonian and asked them what they knew about music boxes and they wrote back and said as far as they knew they, they, it was made in Meridian Connecticut and they figured that they were made between 1830 and 1840 so that would work in about the time that uh, the folks would have got it in, uh, in uh, Adobe. 
so uh, so it's uh, it's old and it's long before they had phonographs or <laughs> radios or anything like that. Well, it's beautiful. <laughs> Uh, did you, uh, you had, did you just, besides the bakery, what else did you do for a living? Oh, uh, I developed baker's asthma working through World War II. I worked such long hours and in there breathing flour dust continuously. I, I got so I couldn't breathe into my lungs, so I got out of the bakery in 46. And then I got a job with California Packing Corporation. And I worked with them until they moved out of this territory in, uh, I think, 62 or sometime along in there. Then I was uh, close to retirement age, so... In